Um, yep, I'm just recording now. Thanks, Jess. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, welcome back to you all for our second um, Zoom session on Three Waters. Uh, we'll do a little bit of recapping from the last session and then um, move on to some of the areas where we may want to provide feedback about the proposal. Um, if you've got questions, just raise use the raise hand function and I'll try and organise the, the questions, but I'll hand over to Pat and I think there's going to be um, some slides shared as well on the screen. Kia ora, Pat. Thanks, Rachel. So um, the workshop's in two parts. The first part, um, we uh, wanted to answer some of the questions that came out of the out of the first workshop. And we have Dan Bonifant from Morrison Lowe back at, at three o'clock to um, work through that, ma that, that um, matrix that he put up about issues that might arise. So really this was a chance after you've had a, a one week out of the first work workshop and a chance to think about it, we'd answer this, some specific questions you have and then if there was time with there further questions you wanted to ask. So in the first workshop, we talked through our, our three water assets and the financials. Um, Dan talked about the Wix dashboard and if you've got questions about that, then probably best to wait for Dan when he arrives. And look, I'm sorry, he, he's not available until three o'clock. Um, these key speakers, they're, in, they're, they're working with 67 councils up and down the country. So you've got to um, book your times and, and be grateful for, for the time you get. So Dan will be logging in about three. We talked about the national case for change um, and also talked about the eight week period um, where it is really a chance for us to influence and shape the final proposal. I mean, um, I think Rachel mentioned that this is the first time that the government has ever let local government New Zealand this far into the tent to be influencing uh, government's thinking, which also makes it a challenge for us because there's lots of stuff that we don't know the answers to and we're, we're not the ones holding the pen. But the, the clear message that's um, um, that local government's talking about up and down the country is that our, that our, our concerns are heard and presented to government in a, in a coherent fashion. So at the end of um, uh, September, the government um, gets feedback from all the councils uh, and then cabinet's going to make decisions. Um, we don't know what those decisions are. Um, and um, so we're focused on making sure that, that from our council's point of view, that we um, uh, give clear feedback to the government on the things that are important to our, our community. We've got, um, we were going to have two public meetings uh, next week. They were supposed to be this week, but of course, uh, lockdown stopped that. Uh, and we postponed them until next week, hoping that level two would let us run those. But the level two restrictions are so tough that we couldn't get more than 35 people into Green Meadows and no more than 50 into the northern end of the Trafalgar Centre. And we think that's just not going to work, that we'll get a lot of people wanting to, to come in uh, and, and a lot of frustrated people. So we're going to run them as webinars on the 14th and 16th of September. And um, we've managed to arrange for Jason Krupp the Deputy Chief Executive of LGNZ to um, be speaking, be one of the speakers at, at those meetings as well. So we're envisaging um, maybe 30, 35 minutes of, of, of presentation and then uh, a, a facilitated Q&A through the, through the chat function on those webinars. Very similar to the process that local government New Zealand have been operating very successfully uh, as they've communicated with um, uh, elected representatives throughout the country. <laughs> So um, on to the next slide. Um, and I think the first thing we're going to start talking about is our debt to revenue ratio, ratio, ratios and our financial forecasts. And I think Nikki Harrison, you were going to talk through this. Uh, yes, I was. Um, thank you, Pat. So, um, sorry, Jess, if you just go back uh, one screen. So. There were some questions from uh, the workshop, the first workshop that I we wanted to cover off today. Um, there are still a couple of questions that we're working through, um, which will be brought back as part of the decision making um, process when we, you know, it's part of that due diligence when we actually get to the point of making decisions. Um, 
because there's a l quite a lot more work in, involved with bringing back those um, pieces of work. Uh, so in terms of, uh, there was a question around um, how our debt to revenue looked broken down by the three waters. And so if we just go to the next screen, um, the simplest way to sort of show it is, you know, we had a, um, we showed you what our um, debt to revenue ratio would be um, excluding the three waters, which is actually the yellow line on this. Um, but I think uh, you uh, people, we, we understood that the overall um, three waters debt to revenue ratio was um, a lot higher um, and we wanted to break it out. So you can sort of see, interestingly, that the stormwater debt to revenue ratio is, is, quite, is, is climbing quite substantially. Uh, Water is relatively stable, so that's the grey line through the middle at around, you know, 240 percent. Um, but you can sort of see that stormwater is the one that's, that's really ramping up um, over the um, long term plan in terms of that debt to revenue ratio. So um, just on the next slide, Jess, we just pulled, you know, I just sort of wanted to sort of have a look at the main drivers of the increase in stormwater and wastewater. And you can sort of see from the LTP that we've just recently signed out that there were some quite big projects um, in both stormwater and wastewater that would explain those um, increases. Um, the second question I was going to cover off on the next slide was, there was a question around um, how the, um, you know, what was this, a sort of 30 year, um, a 30 year uh, how our 30 year investment profile looked um, that we had. So the cleanest way to do that really is just to pull out um, our, our, um, uh, sorry, our infrastructure strategy and have a look at that. So um, we don't fully, we don't do debt to revenue ratios out to 30 years because it's, it's, it's near on impossible. So as part of the infrastructure strategy, we really do look at, um, this is the graph that's sort of in the back of the infrastructure uh, strategy. So you can sort of see, I suppose the interesting thing here is really in, in all of the, uh, so this is water supply. Um, so for example, you can see the renewals component that we've been um, got going through the um, long-term plan. Um, and then you can sort of see in five year chunks um, out going out in the LTP. So you can sort of see we do have a higher profile on that renewals um, front than we have in this in this first 10 year period um, as a percentage. But um, I think what one of the um, things there which is linking back to the three waters analysis is, is that that's, that's telling us that they don't believe we're spending enough on renewals for a, a city our size. Um, and so if you just flip through, that's the water supply one, uh, wastewater um, and stormwater. So that's kind of the, the different components of our, our capital program going forward. Um, can, I, can I just so you recall during the long term plan debate, um, particularly um, if you go back to the water, the wastewater one, what the use one, um, or actually the water one's probably better. We talked, uh, Alec and his team talked about the fact that um, Stoke is, is coming due for renewal. So all the all the infrastructure that was put into Stoke in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s as it grew so rapidly is now due for renewal. And we talked about trying to bring some of that work forward into this 10 year period to try and ease the, the, the step that's going to be as those renewals come on, on stream. But um, it just made our, our total debt too high. And there was also questions about deliver, deliverability. So we left it in the years when it is due for renewal. But you can see that around about the year 2030, 31, there's going to be a significant step in the money invested in our water, wastewater, and to a lesser extent, stormwater. And the, the reason there's a, a, a um, lesser focus on stormwater, on 
the, the step is less than stormwater was, there wasn't as much focus on installing stormwater in the uh, in the early 60s. It wasn't until the I think the Tahuna Hill the flood occurred in the early 60s that the lack of stormwater control was identified as an issue for, for Nelson City and we've been playing catch up ever since. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so there are the slides I've got and I think um, Alec was going to talk through, there was a question around the efficiency of our three water services, um, which Alec, do you okay. want to yep. have a chat to? Thank you. Um, so, so thank you. Um, so I, I missed the first workshop, but the way I understand this, the question about our efficiency, and I will just refer to the work that we did under the RFI, the request for information that we were working with WICS, and we had to have that in place um, by December. And you can see that they rated us in the top right hand corner, you'll see that um, that gray block called performance, operating performance assessment, the OPAs, and they assessed uh, all the councils that uh, participated in their RFI as to where they sat. So you can see they uh, classified us as performing in line with expectations, number three. But in terms of our efficiency, there was some data that we queried um, when we got this dashboard. And um, when we questioned that with Wix, uh, for example, if you look at that um, figure at the bottom, um, uh, and I just can't see it fully on my screen, but it says there under services, the 12,341 properties affected by underplanned interruptions. We didn't know where they got that figure from, for example, and I use that as one example. And that 12,341 was actually in the order of about 2,795. So you can see that uh, in that one particular case, the um, uh, the properties affected by unplanned interruptions was certainly never as high as 12,000, was about 2,700, and that's based on all the data we gave them. They did indicate to us uh, that uh, before we even questioned them on some of the factors, we were on the cusp of uh, being in exceeding expectations, so that's the OPA number two, uh, but they certainly confirmed that um, as a result of the additional information that we did supply them, it would be highly likely uh, that Nelson City Council would certainly be in that second band, uh, namely exceeding expectations. So in terms of our efficiency, in terms of the services that we provide as a Nelson City Council, uh, we would uh, be um, uh, rating very, very highly. Um, granted, they, they accepted that at that stage, they weren't going to, um, they had a cutoff in terms of the information and to be honest, um, we didn't push it very much at that stage. Um, we had certainly uh, been a little bit burnt out in terms of the data that we had been supplying. But I thought, uh, you know, that, that sort of ties in with the view that Pat has indicated to you previously, um, that um, in terms of the, the services we supply across the board for water, water um, wastewater and stormwater, uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, fighting above our, um, our weight limit there. So hopefully that answers um, that question in, in a broad outline. Alec, I've, I've just got a question. Um, so I'm looking at that dashboard and I can see the 12,341 and I think that relates to water restrictions. Is that is that what you were referring to or was I mis misunderstanding that? Um, I I just use that as an example, Rachel. There's, there, there were 75 spreadsheets uh, with thousands of lines of data that we were, uh, that we were um, uh, providing uh, as to exactly what that is, I, I don't know, but it would probably be as a result of um, water restrictions, for example, yes. But I just used yes. the example, I wouldn't be able to tell you categorically uh, what all um, uh, items went up to, to for them to derive that figure, other than to say that it wasn't 12,000. And I used that as one example, it was uh, in the order of about 2,700. All right, so I would look at that. So I, I, I thought you might have referred to some other factor, not water restrictions. So I would understand that that is probably, that one may well be right because we volunteered, we have um, volunteered water restrictions to support Tasman in the past. So you know what I mean? We don't have to go into water restrictions, but we've tried to be helpful neighbours. And, and so we've, you know, dropped down We've know we've gone early on those ones before, partly because we were concerned that Tasman were going to need um, to be supplied from us. Does that make sense? 
it makes sense. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that that that's one aspect they are that they arrived in, in getting that. But the overall view um, from from Wix as well as DIA that we would certainly be in the um, exceeds um, expectations category. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I do get that. I just I just mean if one of the factors that they're measuring around performance was an inference that you had because you had water restrictions there was a problem with your water what you were doing in our case we made a very deliberate decision oh absolutely because we were doing cross-boundary support for another council that's all absolutely absolutely yes yes and that's a valid point absolutely okay. yep okay any so, other questions uh, for hopefully alec? i'll answer that question yeah i'll just see if there's any other questions for alec or for nikki i can't see anybody coming up on my list at the moment everyone seems pretty good no, i'll take my hand down Okay, and we'll keep on going. Right, what's next? Okay. So we're back to you, Pat. Uh, I thought you were going to speak to this one, Rachel, about the oh, okay. heads of agreement. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so I guess probably just coming back for the, the context, one of the things that we need to be doing now is... Um, we need to be going through and looking at all of our data, asking the additional questions we've got to understand what is there. Um, we, because there's a lot of information to get through. Um, at some point, I did want to talk about, have a discussion around the um, no council worse off package and the uh, all communities better off package and the, and the transition funding and issues around stranded overhead. So I'm not sure if we're going to get to that, but I'll just note that for the moment. And if anyone's, um, going to cover that that would be helpful let's try and do those ones if we could no i'll keep going um, then. no sorry um so uh, rachel i'll talk to the stranded stranded over oh, you come okay you'll come to that okay so maybe we talk about it now one of the things the, the phrase stranded overheads is used but quite often that means people um um and that's not something that we're going to talk about in, in public workshops. That's something that once, once we understand what's being proposed, we'll be talking with our staff. We're already starting those conversations. But it's, it's yes, we may have um, some asset management software we don't need anymore, but those things are, are pretty easy to, to, to wind up. But it's, 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 it's quite often it's a euphemism for, for, for people and, and staff. And, and part of their job is gone, the other half hasn't. How do we manage through the, through those processes? And that's one of the things where we've, you know, as um, as an SLT, we've made a commitment that one of the things that is that we'll be working hard to make sure that no one is made redundant through this process. We've got, if this, these changes do go ahead, we've got the best part of three years to um, to align our organisation with a, a new way of working. So we have plenty of time, and we have have a re, you know uh, about thirteen percent turnover each year with our staff. So we think we can position ourselves um, to avoid those, those any redundancies. But um, uh, the first conversations will be internal and with our staff, and, and then we will probably brief the councillors in a, a public excluded workshop. It's not the sort of thing we will talk about in the public arena. Okay, thanks, Pat. So if we just go back to the... We can come back to the what we're meant to be doing now package. So if we go to that next slide, Jessica, if we can put that back, and I'll just work our way through these, not quite far. Ah, disappeared, here we go. Okay. So it's part of the proposal um, uh, that's, that has been negotiated with the government to get to this point. There are two components to it that we've looked at. One is the, um, the no worse, and I'll start on the no worse off for councils. So the is that we should read those as no council worse off, um, every community better off. So it's slightly different in terms of how you would look at it. So it's internally focused for the 500 million to ensure that no council is um, financially worse off through the direct impact of the reform. And that that is um, where we, we know that there are some councils around the country where the, the, debt, to, the debt to revenue um, um, improvement won't be there without some additional some, some transitional support. So they'll get um, they'll get a component of additional support, and they may have a higher number of um, um, 
stranded overheads and stranded overhead costs or stranded costs, actually, stranded costs. So the governments that have made some provision for that, they've made that uncapped, so they know that there's a due diligence process if they decide to proceed to actually work that through for every council, so they'll have to come in and do that process. There's also funding for transition support because this isn't an instant process. If they decide to move through on this, they'll have, um, you know, it, it's 2024 before you run through and get the whole thing stood up. So there'll be costs around transition that need to be met. Um, so the intention being that, that the, the council itself, in terms of its financial position, no council is worse off. And for most councils in the modelling, you can see that there is either, you know, as Pat talked about, last week, um, uh, some councils are, um, you know, the, the, the improvements are quite significant for others, they're, they're not as much, but for everyone they're in a better position. And then we've got um, the Better Off Package for Communities, which was a commitment from the government to invest in community wellbeing and the value of local government. Um, so they've made um, a provision uh, or proposing a provision of $2 um, billion of investment funding. Uh, not um, in some criteria around that, but they're fairly, fairly broad. There's a distribution on that funding that's relative to population, um, uh, relative deprivation and land area. And so in that calculation, Nelson was um, nearly 21 million. And there'll be no right answer to that one. That's a bit like the a little bit like the the model, um, the models will show a trend. Um, they'll be um, giving the same sort of outputs, but everyone's numbers will be not necessarily um, absolutely. You know, they'll, they'll all all their direct numbers will be wrong. But in the case of it comes to funding allocations, what I've found is that there's never agreement across local government of what was a fair allocation. So um, it is it is what it is. So um, in terms of some people might have wanted to see a greater proportion allocated to population, some would have wanted to see a greater proportion allocated to land or deprivation. And then the use of that funding is for local wellbeing, um, things associated with climate change and resilience and housing and local placemaking. So it's really that, that um, uh, toward starting to talk to that uh, future for local government and, and wellbeing agenda. So any questions on this slide? I've got Gail and then Matt. Thanks, Rachel. My hand is actually up for Pat's um, so Pat's comment. So I just wanted to clarify, I asked the question about stranded assets. The stranded assets was actually the terminology used. So can he just confirm that, that he said he used another word, stranded something else. So are we, just, are we talking about the same thing? I think so. Um, most of our stranded assets or overheads um, will be... Um, people related. It could be um, staff, it could be office space, uh, uh, software, si software systems is, is, um, would be one thing that we, we, we might have to, um, have to carry for a couple of years till we, get, till we, get, we could get our way out of. But most of those um, st stranded overheads would be to do, would be people related. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, um, Pat, because I was thinking when they said stranded assets, I was thinking of infrastructural type of assets. So it's probably a not a very good terminology from the receiving end. So thank you for that. Now I'll move yeah, sorry. over to... Sorry, Gail, we, we, we may have what, two or three, you know, too many cars, too many vehicles. We might have to sell those sorts of things. But again, it's all people related. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's fine. It's quite different from what I anticipated. So that's good to hear. Um, now I'll go on to the package of local government, Rachel. Um, there have it's been a bit of um, conversation in the community about, about the um, allocation of that funding, which is, well, there's the allocation of the funding, but there's also the calculation of the funding. So given that they seem to have used the same calculation for this as they do for paying um, or allocating funding for um, councillor salaries. I've always thought that it's rather odd because in that case, uh, we're doing the same job as somebody in Auckland and they're getting paid humongous amounts of money, um, probably for not much less time, or actually quite often I've heard less time than what we spend. So how did we actually, how did they come up with, who agreed with this calculation or the formula they call it? 
Uh, there's a negotiation around that in terms of what's fair across local government and what the government was prepared to provide. And I think the difference between looking at it from um, a salary aspect is, you know, if you're thinking population will play a role. So if you're investing in community wellbeing, that means you've got a lot more people you need to invest in. So you, it makes sense that there's a population. Um, relative deprivation, again, it's a, these are people focused, predominantly people focused attributes, but land is also one where you might, you know, if you've got a large area, you'll have more community halls, you know, potentially you need just more of them. So if you try to, you know, invest in wellbeing, um, it's a it's quite a small allocation, I think, for land this time. They're predominantly, it's predominantly around population. Okay. So, so as I said, how, there's no, no right formula. So how, um, what basis did they use for um, our numbers? Because I'm not so sure that uh, that last census is much help to us, right? Do you want, have, have they have they updated the the figures that they based this on? I, I, I don't have that level of detail, Gail, but we could find that out. And so this is one thing we can provide feedback on if we don't think that that is a fair, um, you know, either quantum or mm. fair or fair formula, then we can provide feedback on that. But I've, I just, well, I think someone's making a note of the question. So I think, yeah, just if we can check that our figures were sort of reflective of what they actually are. And the last question I guess I've got is that regarding the, the spending off. So um, what's the uh, what's the thinking about where that fund is going to go um, and how it's going to be spent? How And what's the, what's the method for that? Uh, there is, there is, that third bullet point on the left gives a summary of the types of things that the funding can be used for. And then I think there's some engagement, intent for some engagement with, with iwi and given it's, um, um, and there'll be some um, process to apply to the government, but nothing as complicated as the provincial growth fund process is what we're told. So if we're going to do that, we'd want a relatively straightforward, simple process to be able to access that funding. And I think from memory, about 500 million of it across the country is available um, for release by the middle of next year. Okay, thanks, Gail. Matt. Thanks, Rachel. So I'm just wondering, is this the government's best offer? Um, I think, I th it's, I think there's always a challenge for the government in balancing priorities, and that's really a decision for the Minister of, you know, recommendation of the Minister of Finance to Cabinet. Um, given the, you know, the, the lockdown impacts of COVID creating more pressure on the government, I think it's unlikely for that to go up as a total quantum, but if you don't think it's reasonable, then we should go back and say that. I'm just conscious there are a lot of pressures on the government's, government's finances at the moment. Sure. I'm also conscious of a, a growing backlash against this uh, proposal. So, so I'm just wondering, you know, is this set in stone or is, is there the ability for some movement? Pat's got his hand up. It's a proposal, so there's all you can always go back. But Pat, did you have any thoughts on that? I... So there's a lot of focus on the $20.7 million, but I just also wanted to talk through the numbers. So, our total three water assets at a projected at the 30th of June 24 to be $716 million. Now, i um, been told I have to say that's land which has been revalued at current market value. Buildings and equipment are valued at historical costs, less depreciation, and infrastructure was, which is revalued at replacement costs, less accumulated depreciation. And also, we aren't sure what stormwater assets would transfer. So that's, that's our, our accounting estimate based on a long-term plan of what our assets would be in um, on 30th of June 2024, 716 million. And associated with that is um, $81.5 million worth of debt. So we get paid that too. So um, it's not just $20.7 million. We, um, we would get $81.5 million to um, pay off the debt associated with those assets, which is an important part of the package as well. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Okay, Matt, any other questions from Matt? No? Okay, um, Tim. Thank you. Just um, as probably fundamental, this better off side of it, you've got $2 billion of funding to invest in future local government. 
and then Nelson gets 20 million and it's used support. And it may, it's calculated on relative deprivation, land area, et cetera. So I don't understand. I mean, I understand the terminology, but I don't understand how that's got to do with three waters. So it doesn't have to do with three waters. So it's not a it's not a payment for the assets. So let's be really clear. No, on that. so I understand so what, what I it understand, is. Yeah. I understand that they could have given us that money. I mean, a lot two billion dollars, a lot of money to be giving, and it's in regards to improving the future of local government and a community well-being. That's all like a welfare payment to us as a city. I don't understand the engine behind that because it's great that we get that, but they don't need to be doing that for an asset. They could be just doing it outright. And, and the other one is a relevant... Yes, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I don't, they seem completely different achievements, but bundling it under and a water reform. I'm missing yes. something. I, well, I think one part of the feedback through over the last year has been an anxiety, I think, from some from some members of local government that, that there was a lack of confidence in local government as a whole. And I think this is an indication from the Minister of Local Government that, that is not the case. And given the legislation was changed to put the well-beings back in, this is a signal to say, yes, we do want to support local government and communities and communities to thrive. And I think also a recognition of the climate change resilience issues are really stretching councils as well. So that's, we also saw money come through for flood resilience um, last year. So I think it's a recognition that those costs are, are pretty high for us. Okay, I've just seen this. Oh, well, we, we, could we could tell them we don't want it if you want. It's, it's an option. Maybe no, we could them. say, well, it's still coming out of taxpayer money. Not debating that, but um, these are two different, two different, completely different things happening here. Are putting money in because they think that we need help as a local authority or the local people, which okay, well, if they want to offer it us as a charity like that, by all means. But on the other hand, in taking away our local authority on our assets, so it just seems like two different things. I can't see how they're linked. So this part okay. is some of this money is crown funding, and some of this is release of equity from the water entity. So you've got two components, I think, sitting in there. So you've got release of equity from the um, from the water entities. That's the proposal, and some is crown yeah. funding. But I'll keep going on to Brian. Yeah, keep going, keep going. Yep. yep. And we okay. And I'm not keeping it on the chat box. Sorry, team. Um, Brian. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is a. Uh... A question for this particular aspect, but I'm just thinking about the no worse off, and I'm, and I'm trying to think. We're pretty up straight up with our fix with our you know, revenues that we're getting from our three waters, probably the water supply and so forth. But I'm just wondering, is that the same standard that's been applied across the country, and does that have a variation? Because I'm looking at some, you know, there's some examples there where we're carrying debt uh, for the asset. We're getting some revenue off that, and I suppose does that calculate what, what we've been asked to is that is that the loss of that revenue comparison to the debt that we're carrying? And because there are some councils that say that they have no debt on their three uh, their three waters or very little debt, and they're using it as a, a basically a form of revenue. So I'll hand, I'll hand this to Pat, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just getting my head around that is that there seems to be different levels of debt for the asset and that the revenues are being applied differently, I suppose. So is a, you know, a bit of cross subsidization going on or a bit of creative counting in terms of some councils or in terms of the way where their debt lies and where the revenues are received from? So uh, I don't know if I call it creative accounting. Different councils do things in different ways. I mean, we uh, we operate closed accounts um, where where the costs sit where they fall. Um, but uh, I think um, the the example was given of Wellington, where they so supply supplied their electricity. They sold their electricity, their power, their lines company, to help fund um, major upgrades up to their wastewater um, system and treatment system. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, some councils have no debt at all, uh, so so they're handing over these assets. They will they will lose lose revenue. Um, 
And yes, it's from some of the workshops, uh, some of the national um, Zoom meetings, it's pretty clear that, that some councils have are using money from their three waters to subsidize other activities. And some councils are subsidizing their, um, their three water activities from, from general rates. There's also been questions about councils who are using dropping their wastewater charges as an economic in incentive, which means once again, rates are subsidizing the, the wastewater activity. So I suspect there are 67 different ways of doing this. And that's one of the challenges Wix has had is trying to untangle all of, all of this and why every council has something that's not quite right. But yeah, it's, there is, we, we operate a fairly uh, pure system um, uh, by national standards. In terms okay, of so just, so just so I'm clear that each of the, the three, you know, the three activities, wastewater, water supply and stormwater, all closed accounts. So the revenues, the debts are, are against those, those activities and the revenues received are against those three activities separately. And Nikki, this is where you come in and support your chief executive. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> Brian. So they, because they are um, closed. Um, closed accounts. Closed accounts. We've, we've, as, actually ring fencing these is very, very easy for us because they're all separate closed targeted rates accounts. So the debt and the revenue are, is very, very clean. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Brian. Right, thanks. Rohan. That's actually my question answered. Oh, brilliant. Okay. So we'll move along. We'll go back to what's which slide's going to pop up next. I'll wait and see what it is. See who's going to answer it. What have we got next? So we can either go, um, we can go into the transition process um, or um, the... I think we'll go back to this one. I think we'll go to this one, I think, Jessica, and then we'll work our way through it, because really we need to start focusing on what we want to tell the government about um, areas that we think need, you know, if they're going to, you know, if they're looking at this, where we think improvement needs to be made. So yep. some of the shared objectives are set out on the screen here. Um, there are safeguards about... Oops. Sorry, sorry. There are safeguards against privatisation. Um, we might want to talk about whether we think they're strong enough or not. So I'm interested in that um, aspect. Um, improvements in obviously the safety and quality of water and environmental outcomes. Um, equitable access to affordable three waters. And one of the intentions is that the in each water services entity, every customer will pay the same base rate. So, so whether you, you know, in our case, an entity C the base rate for water will be the same price here as it would be in Melbourne, as it would be in, um, in Central Hawke's Bay. But council communities could order up if they wanted to, they could decide and that they wanted the water entity to deliver them something um, a bit special. They decide that's what their community wants and I guess they can then negotiate to buy that additional um, service from the water entity and then they would pay a different price if they wanted to have above the base level of service. So we need to talk about coordination of resources and planning and um, making sure for the system that it's we've got regulatory coherence and, internet and institutional settings, which one of the factors, and I'm not sure we're going to get to that on these slides today, is the role of the economic regulator. And that's something new in our system and a really important sort of distinction about about what, what is different. Um, I think there might be a slide of Tomara Atawai, so Pat will probably talk to that and can relate the same situation here for environmental. Um, and then these are the other sort of aspects that we're looking at. So importantly, we need to make sure that we've got um, resilience across the three waters and we're starting to see that real impact on climate change and, um, and the freshwater standards and financial sustainability for the entities transparency and accountability and ability to, I think it might say borrow, I'm going to have to change my picture on a benchmark, which we can't do at the moment. So it's very, very difficult to benchmark across the country and retaining the placemaking role and wellbeing mandate. And I really would like to have a good conversation about those last two and the governance role. So let's see what the, and you just chip in here, Pat and Nikki or Alec, if you've got anything to add to those ones. So, um, so areas for more discussion. So I guess, how, do we need anything more on the debt to revenue efficient and inefficiencies part? We'll come to the non-financials. So is anyone wants to put you back up again? 
Uh, Tim, you got a further question? Or is your hand? No, okay. I think we've got the dashboard. Everyone's comfortable with the dashboard, what that said? I've got okay. one question on that. Oh, Rohan, yeah, great. Yeah, just looking at, just on those numbers on the dashboard where you've got the $1,050 current household cost per annum versus the $1,260 um, with reform. Is that with reform number, I'm guessing that's exclusive, not including inflation. Is that correct? That is correct. It's yeah, some okay. present, present day dollars, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you're, on mute. Say you're on mute. Yeah. I was going to say they were projecting very low inflation otherwise. And the 1050 I think, is low. That's Wick's assessment of what we should be charging. I think our number is nearer. Twelve hundred dollars per household. Is it Nick? Is it not Nicky? Um, it's uh, thirteen hundred, um, excluding, okay. just, oh, including just actually. So, it, yeah. How much? Thirteen hundred dollars, including GSP. Thirteen sixty or thirteen just thirteen. Uh, it's one thousand two hundred ninety-seven, I think. Plus GST. Okay. <laughs> Plus, uh, including GST. Oh. All right, any, so any other questions on the financials? No, they're good. Okay, right, we'll whip back to the other slide. See what's coming next. Okay, so I think we're good on that one. Um, we're going to come to the non-financial. Sorry. Oh, Rohan, yeah. Just, just one more question. So does that mean that they're expecting that, that we'll see a reduction in charges under the reform? Not, not straight away. They think it'll take them you know, three to five years to start achieving efficiencies. They've got to, to combine, into the C, I think, is to combine 22 councils. So getting that sorted, um, getting their house in order, and then starting to apply efficiencies. I think they're, my recollection, they're talking three to five years before you start to see things tracking down. And the, the, they're talking about achieving these efficiencies over 20 years. So I think um, Wix was imposed a 2% per annum target on Scottish water to drive their costs down. So it, it's a long-term objective. So I expect you to see a little bit of a go up and then, then start to, um, to drop down. How many councils are in, in that boat where if you exclude inflation that they're expecting pre present, in present day costs, a reduction in, um, in from current day by 2051? Um, I've seen some information that Waimakariri think that they can achieve that. That was their assessment. But um, Wix doesn't think anyone can achieve that. It, there's no one on their own. In fact, our, our number, Rohan, is the second lowest. Um, I think Watercare, if they continue to stand on their own, they would rise to about $1,900 in 2050. And I think we're the second lowest of the country at 2300 I've seen some information that um, Waimakariri think they can get down to 900 910 dollars i think it was um but um i i haven't looked into how they they calculated that yeah so i i mean under under the reform itself um how many of the councils whereas uh, is it expected to be in 2051 less than what they're currently um doing on their own oh, everybody, everybody everybody wins on this so yeah. auckland's number drops from 1900 to 800 um so you know, everybody wins, it's just some win more than others, but it's, it's good for everybody. Okay, thank you. Pat, do you want to talk about um, Tomata Arawai and the Water Services Bill? Yes, I'll just give me a second, Rachel. I had some notes and I've got rid of them again. So one of the things that's uh, becoming clear is there have been, um, there's always been no enforcement of the drinking water standards un under the Health Act. Um, it's, um, and one of the things that we have talked about is, is that this is sparked by, by Havelock North, where there were five and a half thousand cases of Campylobacter and four deaths. But in 1996, Ashburton had 19 cases of Campylobacter, 33 probable from water supply. Havelock North had another incident in 1998 with Campylobacter and its water supply. And Garfield in 2012 had 29 cases and 109 probables. You'll recall this, this was the information that was presented to us when we were talking about our, um, 
water water supply by law. So it's not as if as an industry industry we have um, done well, which is why one of the recommendations from the Havelock, Havelock North inquiry was um, the um, to establish a, uh, a drinking water regulator, which is what they've done, uh, and and that means that um, as as we've said before. You can't assume that the status quo today is going to apply for the next um, 30 years. In fact, you can't assume it's going to apply for the next five years. Um, this water services bill um, that establishes Tomata Arawai and the regulations around it, it's, they're, they're very tough provisions here. 300, maximum penalty of $300,000 for an individual, and it can be $50,000 for a staff member. So they're taking this very seriously and one and a half million dollars for organizations. Um, so drinking water standards, um, the standards have been in place for some years, but this is simply going to be tough enforcement of them. The other thing, and this is where we think a lot of the money is going to come from, there is a strong suggestion there are going to be minimum wastewater discharge standards set. Um, and that'll set a baseline for all um, um, uh, resource consents for wastewater treatment plants in the future. Doesn't mean that's the standard that gets set, that's just the minimum standard. And that is also going to see costs rise and levels of tolerances for overflows uh, are going to, um, going, to, going to reduce as well. And I was at a meeting um, where Alan Pragnall from DIA was talking to all the mayors and, and CEs throughout the country and, and oh, sorry, Area C. And the comment was that really, Will wastewater ponds still be a, a practical solution in the future? They, they were a great solution in the 1960s and 1970s as we started to provide some treatment, but they are a natural process. You can't control them. And at the change of seasons, standards tend to slip, which is why we have mechanical um, plant associated with our oxidation ponds now. But there's an awful lot of the country relies on those and that will change. And then we have uh, stormwater standards. So you'll see that our, Stormwater costs uh, uh, at, at debt to revenue ratio there is is big because we're spending a lot on stormwater, and while we are look at working hard to improve the standard of our, uh, our rivers and streams, uh, we're only just starting to grapple with with stormwater quality, and that's going to be another big cost driver. So I really do think that that that's where the the biggest costs are going to fall is wastewater and stormwater. Um, so. It, anyone who's looking at what we're doing now and saying that we, we are okay is, is not looking at the future. Thanks, Pat. Okay, so there's a big change coming there. Um, we've also got sitting in there the economic regulator and consumer protection. So we, uh, we've got that something new in the system. So you will have an economic regulator um, proposed in this discussion around what consumer protection will be there. And we're waiting on a bit more um, um, whether we may see some more information come come out on that, um, uh, I'm not sure how far away that'll be. That'll be a new stand up that we don't have at the moment in terms of the system. So I just wonder if we should probably move on. Just thinking about time because Dan's going to join us shortly to try and sort of work through the next steps. Um, this is a very this is the governance model. I do want to spend some time getting your feedback on this because this is one area that you can see this um, wiring diagram here. Um, it, which it sets out, I, um, me not having the pointer, um, you will, you'll see at the top of the diagram, you've got your, basically your local ownership. So the intention is that in each entity, the local authorities will be the named owners of the entity. And then we will also be, then there's a, what's called a, um, a regional representative group. And that will be made up of local authority representatives and also mana whenua representatives. And there have been, and this is one area where there are questions is, and you may have those, why are mana whenua coming into this space? Why are mana whenua going to be um, the, the, um, in, involved in here? They're not the owners. So we, you see at the top, local ownership is there. But why is mana whenua here? And this is pretty much a, um, a bottom line for the government. They've said, no, they want to move through with uh, mana whenua representation, which is, uh, which is a reflection of the tamana o te wai um, principles that are coming into the new um, the new legislation that, and the new Tomara um, Atawai, the new environmental regulator, and you'll see that 
um, the importance of water to to Māori is very well known. So that's you know and, and a, a significant principle. So that's starting to see that sort of that embedded. We've also seen that change across our planning legislation and um, and our way of operating, even across what we do in local government is, is now reflecting far more of um, the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, although this is not a this is not a crown relationship, this is a um, mana whenua um, relationship, so with iwi. And then you have a process where that group appoints and monitors an independent selection panel that then appoints and monitors the um, entities board. Off to the side, you've got um, the representative group being responsible for doing the statement and um, statement and performance expectations, the statement of intent process and the key planning and strategic documents. And you've got a, a very direct mana whenua produced the Tamana Oti Y statements and statement of expectations coming through there as well. So that's that those purple boxes, the three that come down here, they're very familiar to us. So they're very much the process that we go through and we work on with our um, CCOs and CCTOs. So you're very familiar with that. What we've got along, you know, sitting alongside that on the other side, you start to see all the other components who are here. So Tamata Arawai, the environmental regulator, the regional councils that will be there, um, you know, as a unitary, you remember we always have that division of the regulator who's going to come along the compliance part the new economic regulator and the consumer body, which is going to have, give local customers a voice in the process. One of the parts where we've had a lot of feedback is that this, this getting from the purple box to the orange box is um, too convoluted and too distant. And I just want to test this out with you in terms of this is the round governance control and how comfortable you are with this, with this box. Quite a few of the councils that I've been meeting with over the last few weeks have said, no, they want this to be um, closer. They want to have more influence over the strategic um, direction of the organisations. And this isn't about delivering our plans. It's around the sort of things that, you know, we would put into an SOE, SOE, SOI process. So I just want to get your feedback on that. There's been consideration of whether we do go more to the Tasmanian model. So if you watch the webinars around that and we use a you know where where there's a direct um, appointment of the board one thing we have to achieve though is balance sheet separation so um, and that's important both for the crown so the crown don't want the entities sitting directly on their balance sheet otherwise it really constrains the crown's ability to borrow they would they have, if they're on the unconsolidated balance sheet that might be doable but at the moment they're not in this model so the crown's not here and we if we have entities sitting on our balance sheets, then we are constrained. It's back to the constraint that we have on the ability to borrow. So any thoughts on the governance model and how that could be improved? And any questions about understanding it as well? Mel. Thanks, Rachel. Um, appreciate what you've said. I'd like you to take us through slowly each one of these um, levels of, of management here, starting with the regional representation group, their role, the independent selection panel, their role, the entity board decision makers, their role, and then entity management. That's sort of in the same beigey sort of coloured um, box. Yep. And uh, that looks like a lot of bureaucracy to me. Yes, it does to me too, Mel. So I, I'm not, um, so I'll put my cards on the table. I want to see a change here. So that's one of the reasons this particular um, area was not agreed between local government New Zealand and the Crown. So we said, no, well, this needs further work um, is, is local government New Zealand. And so the ministers said, right, well, you go and tell us, go out to talk to your sector and come back with a better idea than what we've got here. So um, Pat, if you want to chip in here too to, to talk us, to, do you want to do the talking through the elements or just for, so there's a change of voice? Or are you happy for me to do it? No, I'm happy to have a go, Rachel. So the intention is that, um, so the local, if you're starting at the top left hand corner with the local ownership, so that for NCC, that will be 22 local authorities. And I'm, I'm not sure how many iwi would be sitting in the Mount of Whenua box, but the, the intention would be that then. And this is all about this balance sheet separation um, that Rachel talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and then 
the, the local authorities, the 22 of them would appoint six, up to six local authority representatives who would sit with, with six mana whenua representatives on that regional represent, representation group. And then that group, and this is, this is the, the piece that really I, I, I struggle with is, they then appoint an independent selection panel whose only role is then to appoint the entity board. And could I just point out now that none of those layers of bureaucracy are management. Those are all governance layers. They are um, so that entity management is where the chief executive and the, um, and the staff sit is right down the bottom. So it's, it's a, a, and so that entity board, that would be a board of, of, of professional directors. So that's how that board, that's how that board gets appointed. And that's where there's been all, um, the meetings I've been at, uh, a lot of pushback from mayors and councils throughout the country about how can we, in, how do we have any influence and very different from the Tasmanian model, which was more like a, a CCO. So it's, it's how do we get more input into being able to have a conversation with um, the, the chair of the board and the chief executive um, without this massive buffer in between and without damaging the, the um, balance sheet separation. Do you, did you want me to talk about some of the... Um... Where do we fit in there? Where do we get our voice for Nelson in this, this hierarchy? So at the moment, you would be sitting in, in local ownership, and I think that you would be hoping that, that out of those 22 councils, that, that, um, that one of the six local authority representatives would be from Te Tau from top of the south. Um, who would then appoint the independence help with six iwi reps to appoint the independent selection panel? So it's it is a um, it is a, a very long arm's length relationship now. It really is. Thanks for your honesty with that, Pat. I do appreciate it because that's exactly what it looks like to me too. And um, you know, I sort of have a funny feeling down the spine, and you talk about efficiencies, and then you project them out right out to two thousand and. 50, I mean, 2050, one or something. Um, uh, with a structure like that, I just cannot see. Uh, and then you say, oh, we're not going to see them for five years. I, I, uh, I beg to say that, uh, differ and say that um, I don't think you'll see any at all, quite frankly. So that's, that's the structure that appoints the board. But that board is going to be, and the entity management are going to be answerable to Tomata Arawai about um, uh, improving the standards of drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater. The economic regulator is also going to be talking to the board, and they're going to be saying, we're looking at what the best practice in the UK, Scotland, and, and the EU, and your costs are too high, get them down. So there's going, and the regional councils will also be the ones responsible for setting water. Um, uh, wastewater and stormwater discharge standards. So there will be a lot of input coming in from that side. So the efficiencies start to come from the entity board down. The efficiency drive is within the orange box. Uh, everything above that is all is really about appointing the board that then gets on with the job of running it. So uh, if, if it was a normal process, this the struct the top structure might get together once a year as, as directors come up for renewal. Um, but it may be that the local ownership appoints the, their, their representatives to the regional representative group every three years. So that those top two layers, the top layer may only meet once at the start of a triennium to appoint the local authority representatives that may meet once or twice a year to review appointments to the um, independent selection panel. And then the independent selection panel maybe annually appoint someone to the entity board. It's so that the so, top piece doesn't do much, doesn't meet all the time. So Pat, the only thing I'd say is look at, and I know Dan's, Dan's right, so I'll, I'll come along and say hello to Dan in a minute. And if you want to add anything, Dan, just put your, raise your hand and then you'll, I'll be able to see you. The only other thing I can see in there is, is see that line that runs between the local ownership directly to the entity. And there is there will be an expectation that the entities are directly reporting to council. So they will need to come and present just as our, share, as our you know, port company, airport company, they'll have to come and um, present and have a direct relationship with the owners as um, in terms of the delivering the services that need to be delivered around planning, around our planning. 
So that, that would be the link that's there. But my view is this is too convoluted and it's too far away from um, influence over the directors. So um, how we can get that, that's an error. I, I don't know the solution yet, Mel, but I'd oh. like to see that changed. Well, I, I like to, I'm liking what I hear. So thank you for that, your reaction to that. Um, there's no uh, local body representatives at all on that um, entity board. The decision makers on the direct entity uh Down there. well I, I actually don't know that there's been a thinking to go could you be excluded if you were a competency if it's company based board and you were competent to do it i don't know the answer to that now i'm, I'm dan might i don't know if there was an exclusion on, i, I haven't that. heard an exclusion but i think the presumption around it is that it's not that it's a complete separation Yes, I think the uh, the re report that the government's working on from those 32 people that visited the uh, Tasmania and Scotland and the UK sort of made that quite clear that there was to be no local government representatives on that entity board. I'm Not sure directly, I'm no. I'm sure I read that. Okay. Thanks, anyway. Mel. Okay, right. I'll go on to Tim and then Brian and then Pete and then I'm... We're going to hand over to the next slide to Dan. Thank you. So again, I'm understanding who's going to be governing, making decisions for water for Nelson. You're going to have, going to that chart, you're going to have iwi from the top of the south on that and non-iwi from somewhere else. You will have, right? you'll have, in this case, three entities C, you will have all of the owners, which will be all of the councils, and then coming into the regional representation group, you'll have representatives from all of the iwi across all of the council areas. That makes sense. And they'll have to put nominations up. How that's going to happen, this is a area, we had um, we had an entity C Zoom earlier this week with all the councils, and this is a, an area we, we've looked at. And we did talk about the fact that we're used to operating with a much, much bigger structure than, we, we, you know, then six and six, we can do that. But that's that's the intention, Tim. Yep. Okay. And so and the non iwi, they will come from they'll come from from where though I'm, I'm trying to understand is who will be on that will actually have a skin in the game. At the moment, we have skin in the game when we make decisions right or wrong for our water supply, direct to our customers. Um, this you'll have those from a broader area, but may not have anything in no, no ties to to Nelson. Am I? It's going to be difficult getting the right people on the board to represent everybody or anybody. So, how's that? I still don't. I don't understand. I get you'll get iwi, and you'll get non iwi. The non iwi could be from anywhere around the country on that board, doing what they think is best for us, but not really living here, understanding, or even knowing the lay of the land? No, those people will, the people that will be governing that, like in our roles, what would be now at the entity board, which is in my, what is showing as an orange box. But what we also need to talk about is um, how we get the services that we need delivered to our region for growth and development. And that's a different function around how does the council get its plan, so we need to deliver our plan up, and so this is the mm. plan that we need, and this yep. is what we want delivered, and so that's a different conversation to this one, okay. which I think we're going to come to in a minute. So that direction of input, it's got to go two ways. It's So you've got the input from those who are on the board, and then you'll have the input from us, like you're saying, uh, we might say, hey, we need more of this or less of that. It's got information. So I'm just giving my understanding because it's around this ownership change, or not ownership, but governance change and ownership change, how this is all going to work because it's just, it's quite, it's a huge change. It's a huge change, which really detaches from the customer. From what I'll, go across, I'll go across to Dan. So I'm missing something hi, here. Hi, Dan. And hopefully everyone met Dan the other day. Everyone was on the call. You've met Good afternoon. Good day, Dan. Um, hi. I, I was just going to try and... um help you out a bit there tim and say that 
Yeah, traditionally in local government, we, you know, the accountability for the community and the local issues would come down the model, yeah. you know, from, from the owners down through to the entity and back yep. up. Yep. This model is not set up that way. It's actually set up. The accountability up that way is really weak. You know, you've yep. just been talking about the independent selection panel and, and how that just confuses things. The accountability yep. really is trying to be being built out to the side. Now, I'm not for a minute suggesting that it's all there yet, but it's really around, you know, the, the local priorities, the local influence, the um, local needs is supposed to come through in the alignment of planning documents. You know, the, the entity and Nelson are going to have agreed infrastructure priorities that are set out somewhere in, the, in these regional infrastructure plans. So it's actually around the side. That's where your your role actually becomes around the side rather than down top to bottom. And also with the regulators and the consumer body, if that's the water ombudsman, that's the accountability is coming in this way rather than down. So it is a really big difference, really big difference to try and understand how it works. It, so we're on a we're on a bus, but we're not no one's here seated up. We're all hanging on from the outside from the windows, basically hanging on the out the side of the bus as it's traveling and hopefully in the right direction. This is coming in from the side. I still can't see how this gets any benefit to an Elson or Wellington or anyone else as far as a governance ownership. And I see it's trying to fulfill this sort of partnership. And I see there's this um, Mana Finua um, and treaty principle, but then it seems to deviate completely from treaty in regards to us being one people, two cultures. You, what you're doing here, you've got two peoples on one culture, as far as that side of it goes. And as far as any sort of governance structure for any sort of organization, it, it seems to be slicing it, dicing it in such a way that once again, none of us are actually on that on that boat or on that bus. We're actually on the outside trying to hang on. But um, thank you, Andy. I just, I just see a lot, a lot of weaknesses there. But um, okay, I'm, we'll I'm see still, if we can. Listening. I've got my ears open. I'm listening. Okay, see we'll see if we can tease some more of that out in a minute. So, um, Brian and then Pete and then Dan. I think we're going to put up the quadrant slide next. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I've... I'm just trying to get my head around it. I'm just wondering, <clears throat> the role of councils tends to be community representative. So we represent the community who bring their views forward. I'm not sure that sits well as a, in a governance role. So I, I understand about the um, getting a professional board, you know, a professional entity board. You've got water engineers and you've got lawyers and accountants and environmental engineers and people who, um, who are well qualified and well placed to um, provide the governance for a large water entity. And I'm just wondering uh, just how this regional representative group would work and how Nelson's views or interests uh, are carried forward. And I'm just trying to think about, you know, um, do we, you know, is it a bit like an election for, you know, um, to go on the on, on that representative board or is it calculated on terms of asset value that would bring uh that what's going into the water entity I'm, I'm not sure so a bit more thought about about that and i really would like to see a, a real strengthening of that um uh you know statement of intent or statement of objectives or things like that that actually drives the board to deliver the outcomes that you know the community are wanting to see. Um, reasonably familiar with the way we do it with our SOI, but even that can be a bit of a, a slow, ponderous sort of a process. So, is there any thoughts about how that strategic and intent is is put through and um, get, without getting bogged down into the operational level about you know? A pipeline down the street is more important than a pipeline down another street in another city. Any any, any thoughts about what? Um, what that up? Okay, I'll just start the last one, Brian. I don't think this is where you decide which pipes go where. Okay, no, so I, I don't. That. So that, that's, that's, that's not the mechanism. But if you were thinking about some of the things that we put into the SOI SOE discussions, you think about the things that because we don't decide those factors for Port Nelson or the airport. But what yeah. we do put in there are 
Um, we have discussions about um, environmental outcomes, we have this, which will be partly over in the, on the other side of the diagram, but we might have discussions around living wage or all sorts of things like that. Yeah. So they are the sorts of things we'd see in there. So yes, I think there are some real questions about how is this going to work? And um, if anyone on this slide's got the answers, <laughs> there's your chance to speak up. I think the answer is it's too opaque at the moment. Yeah, well, to me, I think the hinge is around the um, the connection between the owner's representatives, okay, council's representatives, and the um, and the entity board. I think that's probably yep. where the pivotal. To me, that's where the pivotal relationship is, and the mechanism about making that work. Yeah, I'd agree with you. Okay, so that would be, that's one of the bit of feedback I think we should give. And we'll, that we'll start doing a summary of those points. Someone's doing those now. Okay, I haven't got anyone else with their hand up. Oh, so, Pete. oh, sorry, Pete, you did, you disappeared on me. Hang on. Sorry, I swear, oh, no, and I've got Pat too. Okay, and Gail, right. <laughs> sorry, Pete, you're on. So in terms of getting our heads around this and um, making some attempt to bring the public along on the ride, I think some comparison with other major entities that council deals with would be helpful. For instance, um, the relationship that we have with Waka Kotahi, um, most people have got their heads around how that works. You know, they're a national body that um, looks after transport services. We engage with them. Generally, the public, well, generally the public are at a certain point with how much they understand although I still think a large proportion of the public don't realise that we don't actually own or operate Rox Road but anyway that's something else I just I, I think that most people understand that relationship then we've got the health reforms which is an interesting kind of comparison because most people understood what happened previously with um, with our local DHBs and boards and stuff, that's all changing. And if you look at the model of the new health regime, the way that it's set up, it's not dissimilar to the model that, that we're looking at on the screen right now, and that there's separate entities for Murray and everybody else, and there's a layer of decision-making that delivers the product at the bottom end, which has a local content. Obviously, there's always going to be a local content. I think that what we're looking at now on screen is way more complicated than the model that the, that the government's put up for health. And I just kind of want to know why. <laughs> so, and at the very least, some comparison between those different entities, if it was explained or those comparisons were drawn, both elected members to try and get their heads around, would have a flow on effect for the general public to be able to understand what's being put in front of us a little bit better. I don't know whether that's okay. useful or not. I think that's really helpful. I think it's a really good idea. So we, I think we could do a bit of a mapping exercise. I think some of the fundamentals here is where the money comes from, but I'll come across to Pat. Did you want to add something in on the structure? Or... So, I, so I don't think there's any doubt that this is probably the most complicated establishment monitoring uh, appointment and, and monitoring process I've, I've ever seen and, and puts anything else in the shade. And I think that's all about this, trying to achieve this balance sheet separation. Um, so we haven't done a, a, gone to a great deal of effort to explain it because that would look like we're defending it and we, um, we don't particularly like it. But because there's, there's some, some of the things in here, aren't, some, some of the provisions aren't even shown on the diagram. So the regional representative group they would uh, issue the equivalent of a letter of expectation. And from that, the board would, would issue the equivalent of a statement of intent. So that's the closest there is to the process we have with relationship to our CCOs at the moment. But it's, it's not, the council may not have a representative on that regional representative group unless the numbers are dramatically increased. But on top of that, um, the board will have to uh, engage with the, the consumers and communities on the preparation of an investment prioritization methodology. So that's what are they going to do about growth? What are they going to do about lifting drinking water standards? Uh, and where's the money going to go on their asset management plan and the funding and pricing plan? And 
the entity will be, will be required to take that feedback into account and will actually has to make public a report on how it has uh, a comp taken that feedback into consideration. So as, as um, Dan was saying, there's a, there's a lot of work going out the side. It's that, that purple dot uh, block called key planning and strategic documents. They're also exposed to establish a, a consumer forum um, that will pr provide them with assistance and advice on their engagement and their, and their feedback processes. So there is a, a lot more that's not in this diagram, but it does get um, uh, very, very complicated if you try and show all of, all of that in the diagram. And it, it, yes, and I agree with what Pete says, it's um, very hard to explain um, to anyone. Thanks, Pat. I've gone to Gail. Um, thanks, Rachel. Look, yeah, totally agree with Pete. He um, said a lot of um, what I was thinking about, about particularly when I'm looking at this diagram and working out how how it all, how it all comes together and what it all means. So what I do know is that there are, is a lot of um, there's a lot of talk in the community, um, and there's a lot of misunderstanding, probably because there's been a, a gap. There hasn't been um, there hasn't been a pretty there hasn't been a straightforward dialogue about what, what it actually means. I think the idea is out there, but people actually really want to know. They're not dumb. They actually want to know how it's going to work in actual terms. So the things that I've heard are the local ownership, and they don't understand that. Can we explain that better? How does it fit with the customer? How do they get their store? You know, if they've got an issue, I mean, it's two things for the customer, it's the cost and it's, and it's the um, services. So if they've got a problem with the services, how's that gonna look under a new system? They want some certainty of quality of the environment. So these are all things, I think they've got every right to know. And I think that it's really important that it's explained better, actually so that we can understand it too. But I think those are the, there's some fairly basic stuff that's not actually um, explained very well. And I think it's important that, that particularly ownership and what happens on, on a household level, if I have a problem, how's that gonna look any different to what it is now? Is it gonna change? How am I gonna have some certainty on that? Um, that diagram is horrendous, actually. I mean, somebody's probably spent days and weeks and months on it, but um, if they're going to, if it's actually gonna look like that in the end, I think they need to take those colors away and actually explain what each one is in a, in a real term. Um, yeah, good luck. So I, I think we're actually making some progress and each time we have a, a webinar and, and a discussion, I think it, it definitely helps. Um, but the important thing is not, it, it's us as well, but it's, the, it's, our, it's our residents, it's our ratepayers. And I, I, you know, I'd like them to be comfortable I don't like the um, uncertainty that that creates. They've got a lot of other stuff going on. Let's just tell a story, perhaps, of some examples is helpful as well. Uh, take an example and explain this is what it will mean in a story, not cartoon, but a story format of what it actually will mean for individuals. I think that's all I've got in feedback. Look, I think it's important that we do feed um, suggestions on thank you for asking about the governance model because I think that is a concern so thank you for the opportunity to um, have another have another go at this. Thanks Gail. Okay and we'll come to a moment there how the customers what the customers experience with, is intended to be like and I'll when I hand across to Dan. So look Dan I reckon we've probably it's it, do you want to have any last points on the governance at the moment we're not solving it all today so this is like round one on governance I have to say. Mel did you want to do you have any last points just on the governance model and then we'll move on to the next slide. Follow up on what Gail said and say that don't underestimate the community. I am amazed actually how many of them are researching every aspect of this. They are certainly going at it, looking at the Scottish model and the UK model and the Tasmanian model. And it is very much um, front of mind for a lot of Nelson people. So I would not say that they're lost or they need some direction on this. They, they certainly are to my pleasant surprise a big number of them are all over it now the question i have for pat just before you go off it is the he said there'll be no representation on the regional representation group i think it is yeah for nelson is that the one that's going to have 12 members pat is it and we'd be lucky to get one on that is that for the is that yeah. I, I, all i was saying was that 
there'll be 22 councils sitting in that top left-hand purple box. Yeah. And, and the way it's set up at the moment, there's a max, there's a there's provision for a maximum of six local authority representatives to get onto the regional representative group. So yeah. my rough calculation would be that what the focus would be that Nelson, Marlborough and Tasman would focus on getting one from the, making sure there was one from the top of the south on that regional representative group. It may be someone from Nelson Mill, um, but that's what Rachel was talking about. Maybe that that expands to to having one representative from from every council. Man of Tuna are, are on that too. Are they six on that as well? That's the proposal, and I guess this is where we need to give feedback. In that chat box, I've said I heard Pat make that comment. So what I've said is we and we will be able to appoint somebody, but with other councils, or we may. Um, place votes for candidates. I don't know. We could do it that way. We could all be voting for candidates. It could be like a, um, I had been seeing governance structures and cooperatives appointed that way. We might ask for a larger representation group or a direct appointment from the regional representation group to the board directors. So that would be taking out that independent selection panel. Now, Dan's probably going to tell me that, that that'll create some problems about balance sheet separation, but I want to really test that out because I still think this is overly complicated. Thanks, Mel. Uh, Great questions. And actually, I was just going to jump in. I see a right, question in chat, <laughs> chat about whether this is um, how similar this is to water care. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, and perhaps at the bottom is the best place to start to answer that question. Water care has customers. Yeah, it deals directly with um, its customers. There is an entity called water care that has a management that is separate from council and it has a board that is separate from council. It does statements of intent, statement of expectation, it produces its asset management plans, it does all of those purple boxes. But where it differs is that the one, two, three, four, five boxes that sit above the orange water care box, they are combined into one for water care. It is Auckland Council. Auckland Council decides how it holds water care to account. It decides how it's going to appoint the directors. Um, so it is a, a simplified version of this. Um, if that makes sense. But partly, part of that is because it's a single entity. Um, and within Auckland Council, there is the Independent Māori Statutory Board, um, which, which fits into the governance model for Auckland Council. But because it is a single organisation, there is some simplicity around the top half of that. Okay, thanks, Dan. Look, I want to move on to the next slide, but if you've got governance questions, sort of we'll tease them out, because I want to if we can just put up the next slide, because Dan, Dan's said, Gave, you remember this one from last time? And Dan's advice to us was, look, he felt, you know, he said, you can focus on the model, but that's probably not where we should be focusing. Let's have a look at the, the other parts of this. So Dan, can, can I hand it across to you to help us sort of work through this? And Rohan's got his hand up. So after you've had a bit of a chat about this, we'll go to him first just to capture his question. Yeah, um, thanks, Rachel. Um, despite me joining you last time, just talk extensively through the financials and the WIC data. Um, my real plea is for every council to, to try and get past that and look at the much bigger picture of the impacts of what this will mean for your community, for the council, the provision of services, the impact on your staff, um, and think about a broader set of factors to feed back up. Because the, in a sense, there's very little us as a sector going back up to the government and saying, oh, DIA, we don't, we don't think you're modelling of $1,260 is right, we think it should be $1,450. That's not going to change anything, but telling DIA what's important to our communities and our councils and where there are gaps in that structure they've developed and suggestions for what that should be is where we can influence the shape of this reform. And this is not intended to be an exhaustive list of all the things that are important. It's supposed to be a starting point for discussion. And what I've found um, and observed to be quite useful around other council tables is using this as a starting point for saying, well, what are the most important things to the Nelson community? What, is, what are the hot points for our community and our council that we need to see addressed in any model and therefore the gaps in the current model? Um, and, I, and I think that's quite a useful way to, to, to get the ideas about what's important What's the model? Where are the gaps? What do we need to see improvements rather than focus on the dollars? Thanks, Dan. Okay, so 
Um, we do this by quadrant. We'll go to Rohan for your question, and then we'll do this maybe by starting with the service quadrant and work around to workforce and then social community wellbeing. Yeah, sorry. My question was more on the um, the governance, just uh, in terms of those 22 councils that would be put into Entity C, I was just curious how many um, sit in a sort of fairly similar boat to NCC. He was sort of talking that, you know, maybe top of the south would be able to get one representative, but I'm, I'm thinking that probably you'd be more likely to try and align alongside the, the needs of um, and the specifics of the of our communities and, and where other places in that entity might have sort of similar um, needs and concerns or be in a similar position. Yeah, you could do it that way, Rohan. In fact, I talked about that with, I forget, might have been Dunedin City Council the other day, around, yeah, you could align it around um, rural councils, you know, provincial, you could do it that way. There is no formula yet, so if that we thought that might be of value, is yeah, well, I, similar, I don't know, Pat, what, what, who's similar to us, I suppose? Um, Napier's yeah. quite similar Napier. to us. Yes, Napier yeah. would be the most similar to us. Yeah. yeah. It's an option. Yeah, there is no hard and fast rules about how that group is established at the moment. And there is certainly room within the model at the moment for the different entities have different approaches to how that regional representative group is brought together. Ryan. Yeah, to the mute off. Just going back to this 3W matrix, and I'm just thinking about um, you know, what's important to our local community. And, I'm, and the ones that sort of stick to my mind is that they're wanting the provision of clean, fresh drinking water at all times and plenty of it. So I think that would be one of the biggest ones. It's become very, very apparent that they've got absolutely is, low to zero tolerance for wastewater discharges into the um, into the marine environment or even the freshwater environment. Just look at the backlash we get every time we have to close the Tahunanui Beach in Nelson Haven after a, a heavy rainfall event, which takes on to a, um, a system where we've got a stormwater system that actually can cope with uh, heavy rainfall events and the, and the stormwater. And then um, just thinking, we've just gone through the uh, resource consents for Bells Island and the discharge of uh, wastewater or just um, into a marine environment from the likes of Bells Island and Nelson North, I think is going at less and less tolerance. So no, I suppose the expectation is that in future that we're looking at things like discharge to land and other, other options of disposing of um, treated wastewater. So if you're focusing on those sorts of outcomes, and what is important to our community is how do we go about achieving that and more importantly how do we go about paying for it so brian would you say that our community i think from the feedback we've had from our community they they're pretty strong on water quality yeah, I, well, I don't i don't yeah. think they would be a i think they would be expecting and you know the standards to be to be there from tomara atuai and and I think we will start to see a push to change our way we're disposing of wastewater. I would say that, and I think the inundation uh, into the stormwater system, particularly in heavy rainfall events, um, you know, it just uh, it causes those spills into the into the um, the marine environment or our coastal environment. You know, when we've got look at the backlash we get every time we've got a sort of old oh, turn and beach beaches closed until it has you know a tide's gone past. It's, um, and then you look at what Tasman have had to cope with with uh, water restrictions. Um, that does so, have, yeah. So having a having a, a fresh water a water supply that can cope with you know the day to day needs throughout the uh, throughout the season throughout the year. So if we were to if, just look just from elected members, does anyone disagree on that? I think our community will have a reasonable expectation that we you know, compliance with standards and an increase in standards, expect, that, that, that would be a reasonable expectation. I don't, I don't think we with what we know about our community, they're pretty, pretty engaged on this subject. Anyone disagree? Any disagreement? Kate, Tim. So you have to unmute Kate. 
goodness me okay long day um i completely agree with brian i think that um what he's said already is is really important to our community i add to that that i would have thought that environmental restoration alongside that's really important so um for example, Bells Island, I know they bought some land to um, discharge solid waste onto land. I know this is water, but I presume that the affluent from Bells Island is part of the picture. Um, so, you know, how, how are we doing environmental restoration alongside improving water quality in our stormwater network, our freshwater network? So uh, consequences for the Mai Tai River when we um, extract, extract water from the roading rather than from the dam in the summer months, that kind of thing. So how do we improve the local um, environmental water network alongside improving our um, drinking water quality? Um, there's one thing I wanted to add, which I've just remembered, is I think um, when we're hearing about these sort of boards and um, highly qualified people sort of managing our water, I, I really, really support that. But I think a social procurement policy is really important to us. I think it's important that we are employing locals, that there's um, fair pay, that there's equity in terms of pay, there's uh, female representation, uh, minority group representation, that um, our boards are not necessarily necessarily being paid high commercial or corporate rates. I mean, I heard what the chief executive of Auckland Port got paid and I just, you know, that I, I think that's quite important to us that this distribution of wealth is fair. Um, so to me, that's an important part of looking at new models. Great, thank uh, you. Feedback? Okay. It's really hopefully helpful. That, was that helpful? I know we were talking about yep. environment, but I feel like... No, 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 no. no I just we, wanted to, while I was thinking about it, I just feel like a, a highly commercial model where people... The, where the um, gap between highly paid people and people who are being paid maybe only just the living wage is, is not something which I think our community is looking to try and change that economic way of thinking for the future. Okay, thanks, Kate. Um, uh, an entirely um, unrepresentative um, survey, but I hear the same thing about um, social procurement and ensuring okay. contractors in small communities remain viable. That's a really recurring theme, and it's... Um, I think it's important to put up because the government's model was about efficiency. Yeah. The sector's response is that, yeah, efficiency is one thing, but there's there's a social cohesive element that needs to be brought in. There's quite yeah. an important um, counter to put forward if that's the position of councils and councils generally. And it's about equitable pay, that people should be paid what they're worth. But, you know, do you have three chief executives? I don't know. It's, it's a very big model, but how do you ensure that your remunerated um, or you're paid for your work, but there's not that big gap, uh, which we sometimes see in those more corporate models. Okay, I'm capturing those in the chat box. We'll go across to Tim. Oh, you've gone, Tim. No, um, Rohan. Yeah, I just thought I'd add in terms sorry. of... Oh, oh, sorry, Tim, Tim. you back. Sorry, sorry, my fault. I hit the um, hand down rather than the mute there. Um, yeah, I'll probably... A, mix of views, but yes, obviously public are always wanting better water, uh, etc. We are very blessed with a very good water supply through through summer and winter. Um, and then there's a commentary about um, our beaches, etc. So, but there's always going to be a bit of misunderstanding. At this point, there's a bit of misunderstanding around the table and that when we have those signs up around Haven Road after a heavy rain or storm events about the, the pollution in the water, that's not from our sewer plant, that's from just what you have anywhere when you have a heavy rain running into our rivers off the land, you get a lot of the uh, pollutants that get run off. There are occasion when our when our pumps get overwhelmed, but um, public is one point where we're saying, hey, we want to improve on all these sorts of things, but on the other hand, they're going to say, well, what cost does that come to? And I see a bit of talk about maybe we should be putting our water not to um, where we've got it at the moment, put it to land, but then we're sort of trying to find the solutions here now rather than this new entity or the existing entity to find that solution. And then what we're doing then is having a solution from outside and we end up like Havelock North is, is due to them putting sewage on their land. It's from them putting it there and it's getting mixed into the, to the water supply or, or the aquifers. Ours is quite different. We get our water from up in the hills and we, and we dispose of our wastewater 
up in towards and they're on Bells Island, etc. Um, but if we start trying to find the solutions now, and the public aren't that silly. I know there's always going to be misunderstandings of public wonder why and how and how can we get this water inundation and in our storm water? How can we get the beaches closed at times um, when we do know exactly what causes much of that? And I think we are able to sl put solutions there. So I'm just, I think there'll be a mix of public. There'll be a public saying, yes, whatever it costs to improve it. And there'll be a public going, well, I think we're doing an extremely good job, always looking for improvements. But at what cost eightfold the debt? And it becomes a nationwide debt rather than a local debt, but it still hits our pockets. And the public understand that if we transfer our debt to the to national, um, to the government, then it's still going to hit our pockets and our taxes. So uh, there'll be a, there'll be two views. There'll be two takes on this. That's my okay. take on it. Thanks, Tom. I think it's really helpful. I just want to pick up that 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 about where the debt lies. So Dan, I think this is one of the governance structure models. Is that the the intent at the moment? is that that debt does not end up on the government's books and therefore impacting our taxes. So that would be one of the reasons okay. that governance looks so convoluted, I think. Yes, oh, yeah, good point. Yeah, it's a, they're trying to balance retaining some council ownership, let's call it, with um, ensuring that there's a balance sheet separation between the councils and the entities, um, while not going quite as far as putting them into the government's balance sheet. So there's a, a sort of a, trying to, trying to get all of these three things happening all at so once. So where's that? So, okay, so thank you for that. So where does it go? So if we, we were looking at the efficiencies, uh, terminology there for being able to leverage more debt when it comes to debt ratio, eightfold rather than one and a half or twofold locally, that sits upon someone's shoulders. You're borrowing it there, but it still it sits, comes it sits from, on the, from the it, customer, from yeah, the customer either direct customer or a nationwide customer? It sits on the entity and the yep. entity is allowed to borrow that money because it is a utility service. Um, and the utilities are allowed to, in the minds of the um, credit rating agencies, borrow significant amounts of money. They have a guaranteed revenue stream for perpetuity. So the, the debt sits on the entity's balance sheets with the sort of caveat on the side that there's four water authorities in New Zealand and the government is never going to let them go under. But then that, that debt or maintaining the operations or maintaining that finance is still comes upon the customer, yes. whatever the efficiency. So the money's not coming from nowhere and no one's paying it. Right. Maybe you're extending it, you're grading the leverage. I mean, I'll get plenty of banks say, well, we'll give you a credit card of this amount. I say, no, I don't need that amount to borrow. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it all it all still come. There's only there's only one group of people who pay for anything in New Zealand. Correct, correct. And and um, okay, thank you for that. But there's obviously lots of okay. questions to come. But thank you. Okay, I'll go now back to Rohan. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to I think build off um some of the things that Kate was saying around environmental protection. One of those being I think that there that there is an expectation for higher qualities of stormwater. Um, and I, I noted that there'll definitely be complexities there in our last workshop, um, especially with the quality of stormwater primarily being determined before it actually enters into pipes. Um, and so I've still got plenty of question marks there. Um, but I also think that resiliency is gonna increasingly be a priority for um, our community and my, I guess, my sort of questions coming out of that would be is we know that one of the key ways um, of improving resiliency, particularly in our wastewater network, um, is through sort of um, not through larger treatment plants, but actually smaller, more distributed ones, basically having more fallbacks. Um, I wonder whether a larger entity's sort of preference, especially if they're seeking um, and will be expected to find um, pretty significant efficiencies, whether that focus is going to be um, more on the side of larger single um, treatment plants to address those challenges and also whether it'll, um, they'll be sort of able to, to keep their ear to the ground um, with, you know, local resiliency challenges. Good questions. Who wants to have got those? 
Chris? So, um, resilience is something that we um, uh, have been talking at a steering group level um, with, with DIA about. DIA about. It's important that the economic regulator recognises that uh, resilience um, is important and is, is, al is allowed for and um, is not something that um, these, these entities are allowed to, to get into. So, you, so they're all your, your key trunk mains are duplicated and diff follow different routes so that you've always got something in play no matter what, what the disaster is. Um, but in terms of treatment plants, uh, I think it was Tasmania, I, I, I lose track of all the information we get, but that they had reduced from something like about seven or 800 treatment plants down to about two or 300 as they had um, started to um, uh, achieve economies of scale. And I know there's um, one North Island Council where they've looked at the cost of renewing a consent for a treatment plant and worked out that it's cheaper to, to lay a, uh, put, build pump stations and pipelines and link them together that some of these smaller townships together and have one, one large treatment plant where they can provide a higher standard of treatment and, and disposal and, and just pay for, for one consent because the consenting costs are getting bigger. So it, it will depend on just how remote those districts are, but I think we will start to see more rationalization of, of treatment plants to try and get them to a, to a higher standard, particularly as I expect, in my personal opinion, that we'll move to more, towards more mechanical plants and less oxidation ponds. Can I, can I just carry on for a second, Rachel? Um, Brian raised a question about integration of um, flood protection and stormwater assets into res residential development and public spaces, where the split would be. And look, this is one of the areas where we, we don't know. It's one of the areas that we, we want more answers um, and we don't have them yet. But I think it is an important point to, to feed back to, to the government is about, um, uh, about this. Um, Thanks. Yes. It's um. I was actually having a look. One of the things that I went to just very quickly. When I went to Denmark. This is one of the things that I looked at there with their water because they've got water entities, slightly different model, similar to Tasmania, but they had um. I think this is a really important part for us around flood protection, climate change resiliency, the DAP processes that we're going to be going through in stormwater because it's all around. A lot of it's around land use and how you deal with that. They've got a, they had a really, it was a really interesting model seeing how they operate and where those costs fall. So, um, you know, there's a bit of a proportionality around, is it for water? So, or is it, is it a recreational value? So if you're building, um, you know, a, um, there are a football field that's, um, or tennis courts that, that are set down, actually that they're, they're lowered down. So you get a recreational benefit, but they're actually a stormwater detention. How do you attribute those costs? And so it's a, I think it's quite a complex issue, but it's a really important one, Rohan, to work through this one. I, I, I was kind of going, oh, we'll keep our stormwater out until I saw the numbers and saw that that's where a lot of our costs are. So I was going, hmm. Just on, on that point from Pat around what Tasmania has seen, has any work been done um, around how that's impacted sort of their overall resiliency? I, I'm guessing it means sort of larger populations relying on on the same singular wastewater treatment plant um, and how they're then accounting for sort of redundancies and and the potential of um, coastal inundation and sea level rise on those uh, treatment plants. I can't answer that one. So Neither can I, but um, one of the things, there was supposed to be a tour to Tasmania towards the end of this year that's now turning into a virtual tour. So if, if um, you're, you're interested, we could probably put you, um, so there'll be a couple of days of Zoom meetings with uh, the relevant people. I have to say the, the Tasmanian uh, talk uh, uh, webinar with, uh, uh, with, with local government was, was very interesting and, and Probably one of the most uh, useful talks there has been on, on this whole three water subject so far. So um, th there would be some value in that. Yeah, I, I'll share the I'll share the link out with all the councillors on that one because it was on on a chairs CEs one I think. So I'll, I'll send I think it's an, out. Email I got... up, an email turned up this afternoon. I think it's got a direct. Oh good. Good. So oh. it's there on. Oh my message, my message got through. That's great. Okay. Yeah, so it's there, uh, there and the Victorian one as well. Brilliant. Okay. 
Dan, what else do we need to cover off just thinking about, I think, their plan, the plan integration one? Yes. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's an issue that's important for everyone, and it's an issue that has to be solved. Um, I, th I think you're having a really good discussion um, about what's important to your community. Uh, and that's going to make, you know, because the end product in a couple of weeks is you've got to prepare a submission that goes back up or a response or a letter or a report. And um, having you articulate all these key issues is, is kind of exactly what you need in order to get to the developing the response. It's a really healthy discussion. Thanks, Dan. Look, in the chat box, Trudy put up a, a comment, so an outsourcing model. So I just don't know, Trudy, do you want to just talk to that one? It was a question. Sorry, I didn't give you a lot of notice that I was coming to you. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry. Um, I was actually typing something else into the chat box. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, it was just about how the assets get split off into the the other box on that governance model, and about then it would then all get outsourced. It would never be insourced. So therefore, that creates a greater cost instead of a lower cost. But I was just. Um, so it was just with a commentary that was being said at the time, it sounded like that's the outsource model that we we're going to instead of setting up an entity to have things in house. Um, but then Pat's comment about the Tasmania model, and this is, hold on, I'm just, just typing it into the chat box, so I'll just take it out. Um, under that model that was talked about the other day, it was interesting because it was a government model, which meant they can't sell off the asset. But this model that we've been showing with the all the top heavy layers um it looks like it creates a vulnerability so the assets could be sold off at a future future date so i'm just yeah i'm trying to look at that but i was also reading the other bit about the financial model so my head's sort of spinning off into all the different complexities of this and i'm just trying to stay focused on the slide that we're on instead of I, I can probably answer your question about the outsource model. I don't think it um, the model it assumes either. It, you know, to be effective, any water entity is going to have to have its own capacity and capability, regardless of how much is outsourced. You still have to have in-house capability and capacity, or else the market will just run over the top of you. Um, but neither does it assume that the entities will become the new public works departments and do everything themselves it's it's reasonably agnostic it's just the model government's modeling just provides the funding in order for activities to happen so there's no presumption that everything's outsourced okay that's that's oh, oh, sorry i keep forgetting i'm muted um so basically we're saying about separating assets and make it easier but basically leads to the spin of a private labor market at a later date. Is that what we're saying? I'll go back to Dan. I don't think so. No, I think what we've got is, I guess the question is, and this is a really good question, is because you've got the government, you know, the, the role of the government in the Tasmanian model, and and you don't know, Dan, you might have some thoughts on that. You might, I don't know if you're about that Tasmanian model, um, because you might want to come to that. But I think one of the things I put in the chat was, is there sufficient protection from privatisation in the model? Is it strong enough at the moment? And that's one of the bits of feedback that's been coming back, that, that protection from privatisation has been key to local government members. And I, and I would have thought my conversations with, with all of you have been that is for us too, that you, you wouldn't want to see these entities privatised. So we might want to just strengthen up that, look for some strengthening there, Trudy. Is that, is that it's probably not quite on point, but I, if you yeah, want to add no, it's, it's just because of the model, the way it's looking, and it's so top heavy, but there's, there's little breaks in there that, as you talked about the separation and the distance, it makes it easier for the assets to be spun off at a later date for privatization. Yeah. And that's quite a vulnerability and that's quite a concern for many of our public and the feedback that we're getting across, which I'm also aware that um, the webinars and stuff, that's been a, a common thread in the conversation as well. So I'm just trying to, um, because I thought the other day when we had our workshop, um, is it Jason? 
um, he mentioned that this is the eight week period that we're supposed to be looking at like the financial models and feeding back in the vulnerabilities and the concerns from the public. And that's a key one is, and we've seen it before um, through government changes. Um, the government of the day come in with different legislations, they look at different things. And um, in the 90s, when all the deregulation came in and the selling off of assets and the privatization of different things, we almost became tenants of our own country and not owning our stuff, which became a great concern. And people still hang on to that lack of trust. And in all the communication and stuff that has come forward under this, and with the model the way it sits, it, it's triggering those people again um, with their concerns about privatization at a future date and why you've got the reassurances from um, the minister um, Mahuda now um, and this is what I alluded to the other day is while she's got the respect and working with local government a lot of her colleagues and members of parliament are saying why are you spending so much time with local government? Um, just get on with it, just regulate it, mandate it, make it happen. So, you know, if a person who walks their talk isn't in that role and she gets a different portfolio, all of a sudden that opens us up to the ability for the uh, government to sell off and move it into a privatisation. And so there are some concerns on that coming through quite strongly with our community, um, as well as... Um, yeah, some other things, but I'm just trying to stay focused on no, the, not, what's in front of us. No, I think that's a very good reflection of what we're hearing. Absolutely. And that is a big issue. And there is a, people do remember what happened. And so I guess that's how do you create, you know, what needs to be sitting in here to provide those protections. But I'll come just come back to Dan, because I'm conscious we're four minutes to four. Um, I, all I was going to say is I, I don't know a lot about the Tasmanian model, um, but what I... And I, you know, I hear the um, comment that it's the government involvement there is, um, you know, helpful to the situation. I probably look at that and I'm a little bit dubious about it. I look at it and say the, the Tasmanian model was designed to pay dividends back to the councils as owners. They, they stopped doing that. You know, they had to stop because they couldn't afford it. They needed to invest the money in infrastructure. Then the state government effectively buys a share of it to introduce additional funding. So you can look at all the different models around the world and you can see good bits and possibly get bad bits in them all. I think, um, you know, I don't want to keep harping back, but I think the key thing is to look at the model that's in front of us, look at what's important to us mm. and, and try and direct it in the right direction. And these ideas, these themes of, you know, accountability to the community, protection from privatisation, um, looking after the local communities and the economy, resilience, all of those things are... The, the flesh that needs to be put on the bones of this proposal. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So we had on the slide earlier on, we won't put them back up again because it's actually a whole lot easier for me if I can see you all, um, was the um, issue of how we get our services delivered. So um, the intention, well, I think is, you know, as I understand it, the long-term plans are the starting position because you've got to have to have a program of works for a new entity to take on board. So we will have that, that sitting there. But what I am interested in doing in, is actually embedding this as a direct, um, as we do the plan making, that the entities are the plan deliverers, if that makes sense. So they are providing services to the customers, but they're also providing services to the network that we need for social and economic development. So we're going to have to think about how we um, actually embed that in as well. I think that's critical. Because for me, the placemaking function, and we talked about resilience before, we're thinking about you know, adaptation around climate change. All of those discussions should be led um, from, a, from local government with the support of others, but they need to be community conversations. So I still haven't seen that piece there yet. So we probably want to bring that back to think about, from my perspective, I'm still working out how I could, how we could wire that in to make that the very clear hierarchy. And that, that will probably would be a legislative fix. So you'd have to have it in the legislation to know how is, what is the hierarchy. And it may be that it's, it's something that goes you know, into the Local Government Act and the legislation that sits there to establish who's the director and who's the deliverer. If that makes any sense. Because I've used the example in the chat boxes, if we had an economic development opportunity, and this came up in the Tasmanian Zoom as well, 
And the mayor there talked about, he did, they had a great opportunity, but they needed for economic development, but they needed water services. He had the ability to go directly to the water entity, services entity, to buy those services. So I want to make sure that we got to have that same ability because sometimes it's not it's not just about existing customers, it's actually about an economic development opportunity that's come along. And you can think of one now, um, the Science and Technology Precinct, where we needed to do some fast work on getting some stormwater pipes out of the way to allow a property transaction to happen. And I still want to make sure that we've got that flexibility to pivot for those opportunities. So Rachel, I have a couple of questions around that. Okay, it's now four o'clock, Kate. So okay. I am gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish because it's been a really long day and I know um, yeah. everyone's got other meetings to go to, but what we'll do is if we can capture, just think about the questions as they come up. Um, who, who's the holder of the, the email to? Have we got a three waters email address or something like that at the moment, or are we, who's gonna be the gatherer? Of, I don't mind doing it, but um, it things, I kind of don't want to give Jenny another task to do to be the um, sorter, Pat. So, so we have a, th a three waters team. Um, I'll, um, I'll, You'll email I'll out. get someone from the team to send that out and, yeah. um, and we'll, we'll um, collate those. Uh, and, and I think start writing a letter, a draft letter to accompany that report um, that the council will be seeing. I think. Okay. Yeah. So look, next steps, we've got a bit to do to get that up to the report. Um, I did get, um, had Ellen um, Pregnall from DIA was on the call, um, as I said earlier this week, to say, look, the ministers, the, the, the waters ministers are really wanting to get this feedback. Um, we, um, there will be more conversations. We're not expecting to solve the governance model in the next couple of weeks, but we need to get the, what are the key themes? If the sector was saying, no, we're absolutely fine with that, um, wiring di diagram, um, then start to go, great, get on with it. That's definitely not the message that's coming through. So, um, and there is a willingness to, to look at some other models. So I think we just need to identify, and if we've got some cunning, cunning solutions, then now's our chance to put them up because um, there are gonna have to be, there, are gonna, there is in my view gonna have to be some change around this to make this palatable to the, to the sector. That, that's my personal view. And I think that's what I'm hearing from all of you on the, on the Zoom today. So look, I thank you. It's been a really long day um, and I'm really grateful for the attendance and thank you again, Dan, for coming in to see us. Um, but that's been great. It really has been good. And I think um, you've given us some, some, some really um, clear guidance about where to focus our energy. Pat, is there any closing comments from you? No, thanks, Rachel. This has been 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 really useful um, uh, in, in terms of us shaping the report to to the council meeting, and we can start um, drafting a, a letter for, for council to to have a look at it at, at that time as well. Okay, great. And look, if I get if I make some more progress on that governance model, even at, you know, because there'll be some um, there's some work that's going to go on in that. In the meantime, I'll bring what I've got back to the council so we can actually start, you know, seeing. Okay, does this is this the area that need, that actually addresses the concerns? What does it look like? So my 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 sense at the moment is um, a bit like Dan's the other day that I don't think the government are going to abandon this. I think they recognise that we need to move from the status quo, and I think there's enough evidence based to say that we need to change that. But there is there are certainly elements of this that still need to be worked through. So I'd really like to see us focus on those things that are important to our community and and get them through. Mel, you know, comments. Yeah. Yes, I have, Rachel. You just pressed a button on me right then. You see, we're going out to the public. Well, no, we're not. We're going to have webinars and Zoom meetings. But, you know, what value, and they need to know this, what value is the thinking from the community going to carry with us? We're the governance body, and I just, I just feel that uh, the matter's been resolved from the way everyone's talking here today, um, and we're going with the opt-in. But to the community, there's a strong, strong feeling that we should stand back. Yes, listen to the opt-in um, case. And we've heard it at this, at this particular workshop and the one before and the webinars. But there is another case. There is another case to do our due diligence, to do our due diligence and look for Nelson. What benefits Nelson, not New Zealand, as has been said mostly, 
what benefits Nelson as far as the opt-out case goes. So we have to, for our credibility's sake, we really do, and I'm very serious about this, and I'm looking, Pat, trying to do my best of looking straight in the eye, and say we want an independent review, similar to Fronga Rai, by the same people, actually, if possible, I think. Um, to look a couple of things, Mel. So I haven't finished yet, Rachel, to oh, give okay. us advice okay. on the water reform opt-out option. Well, I'll go to the advice to Pat in a minute, but a couple of things that we're not being asked to opt in or opt out at the moment. So there's no, that's not what we're being asked to do. In terms of the community, look, we've got some people really engaged on this, as you've said, really engaged um, and very capable, knowledgeable people. So I want to try and get, you know, those conversations going. I think they're important. Um, it, I know all of the elements aren't there for, for us at the moment, um, but there's probably enough to get the, the sense of it. And then the bits that are missing, then I actually think it's useful to talk to people and say, well, it's missing this, but it's missing that. But, but there's no um, in or out option at the moment. But I'll go to Pat for the uh, independent Pat advice. What, what concerns me, though, is we might leave this aspect of it too late. And, uh, you know, we've got to speak up now and say, and I'm trying to do that. Um, and it's too late, we can't well, get a, a review up or a report up. So that's why I'm raising it. Okay, so I'll go across to Pat. Uh, what we won't do is we, we, he will be able to talk about the Castalia report because um, Pat has seen that work before. There's not time to do that today, but we will be able to do that. But just in terms of the independent and that, that report you've seen from commissioned by Whangarei. But Pat, just in terms of the, the, the advice, I mean, we've gotten... Um, so at the moment, we're not asked, being asked to opt in or, or opt out. At the moment, we're, we're being asked to basically comment on what's being proposed, uh, which is what we're doing. I mean, at the end of the day, the government has invited local, all of local government in, inside the tent uh, in terms of trying to work up a proposal that um, addresses the challenges into the future and addresses current concerns. And, and that's, that's what we're doing. If they come back with a, an opt-in, opt-out, then of course we'll have to, to evaluate those options. But I, I have to say that the, the people that are, are um, providing advice to DIA in terms of Farrier Swear and Beckers, I mean, these are big multinational, multi, uh, multinational firms that um, stand or fall on their professional reputations. Dan from Morrison Lowe, when we, when we engaged him to, to review the Wix data, he made it very clear. Um, that he would t tell us what, what he saw, and he has done. So we have three uh, sources of independent advice at, at the moment. I know that DIA are having a look at the um, Castalia um, report, and we'll be providing some commentary on that. But to do the f a full analysis of our own would be very expensive and very time consuming. We've got two months, uh, and what we're trying to do at the moment is provide commentary on the things we like and don't like about the proposal. And then we'll wait for Cabinet to make decisions going forward. In my view, I, I think... think I'm going to give the last word to Dan because he's got a dash and we've got to get off this call because okay. uh, someone else is messaging me and saying, where am I on in my next Zoom? Okay, <laughs> Dan. Um, I, I was just going to say, um, in regards to the Castellia report, a lot of the Castellia report in Whangarei was a critical about this the amount of the investment projected for Whangarei district. Now, what you might remember from the last workshop is that actually the WICS projection of enhancement and level of service investment for Nelson by WICS is very similar to your own projections. The other part of the Castellia report was around the assumptions and where they, where they don't find them to be credible. The, the sensitivity analysis we've already given you largely shows you what happens if you take away those those efficiencies. I'd actually be really interested to see what they'd write, given your situation is quite different to Fongaro. But I think you've got the kind of information to show you well, what if the Wix analysis isn't quite as what it says already. I, I think you've got some stuff to there already. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Right, I'm going to close up. Good to see you all. Have a lovely evening. And thank you for um, persevering from 9 a.m. till after 4 p.m. consistently on Zoom. <laughs> I hope you can still see. I can't see very well now. Okay. Matewa. <laughs> Bye.